uh, final speaker is Dr. Diego Camacho from uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He's the Director of Minimally Invasive Surgery and Bariatric Surgery at Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx. And he's going to tell us all about recurrent right upper quadrant pain and abnormal liver function tests following a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Well, thank you very much for having me here this afternoon. It's an honor for me to present the topic of uh, recurrent right upper quadrant pain and elevated LFTs uh, after uh, cholecystectomy. As you all know, this is a very common scenario uh, for patients to come back one or two weeks after surgery with mild discomfort uh, in the abdominal cavity. And uh, we normally tell them to, you know, reinforce the patient that everything is going to get better and that return if uh, symptoms persist. Uh, but what happens with those patients that return three, six months, up to five years, ten years after their cholecystectomy? So um, I'm going to focus on the chronic problem and not in the acute setting of these patients. So uh, these are my disclosures uh, that won't interrupt with my talk. Uh, a little definition, uh, PCS or uh, post-cholecystectomy syndrome. The first uh, <coughs> definition was uh, in the 1940s and uh, hasn't changed since then. So uh, it's the presence of abdominal discomfort uh, and abdominal right upper quadrant pain and epigastric pain. Um, the timing of symptoms could be, be between a uh, few weeks after surgery all the way to 25 years. The incidence is pretty high, 5 to 10 percent of these patients will return to the clinics. Uh, requiring uh, hospitalization in 7.5 of these patients. Uh, multiple presentations, very benign symptoms, all the way to very debilitating problems. The theologies are um, <coughs> divided in two. The non-biliary causes, uh, uh, the most common one is uh, due to um, increased uh, bile flow into the GI tract and uh, reflux of this uh, bile into the stomach or into the esophagus, creating peptic ulcer problems of gastroesophageal reflux disease. The other one is related to uh, gas pain and uh, diarrhea. So uh, the biliary causes of uh, PCS, I'm going to try not to talk in the early phases because that's a complete uh, different topic right now. I think that I'm going to focus more on the chronic uh, patients with recurrent common bile duct stones, biliary dyskinesia, sphincter or fatty problems. So uh, what are the most common uh, clinical uh, presentations of these patients? Abdominal pain, 90% of the patients will present with pain 30 minutes after having a fatty meal. And the patient uh, will say that uh, the, the, the symptoms last for approximately three to four hours. Jaundice, if there is any type of obstruction in the bile duct. Uh, dyspepsia, 35%, diarrhea and constipation, and nausea and vomiting. So what's the workup evaluation? It's very extensive, uh, but the good thing is that in 90% of the time, we can identify the problem. Uh, we start with a very good history and physical examination and try to obtain all medical records of the operative report to see if there are any uh, complications of what type of surgery was performed on the patient. The most common laboratory studies uh, order are CVC and LFTs, uh, amylase and lipase. So the imaging evaluation, I'm going <clears> to <throat> get into more uh, detail uh, when I talk about the different scenarios. But we start with uh, chest x-rays to see if there are not uh, uh, any abnormalities in the um, chest cavity. And the most common non-invasive, uh, the transabdominal ultrasound is uh, first line. And uh, we start going there for a CAT scan, ERCP, MRCPs, or endoscopic ultrasound. So what are the modalities of the diagnosis? Uh, Alone, the LFTs uh, are not uh, very uh, sensitive, as you can tell. But when you combine the LFTs and the transabdominal uh, ultrasound, the sensitivity goes to 95%, that accuracy up to 98%. Uh, so what are the algorithms that we currently have? So if we have a patient who comes back to the office with uh, abdominal pain and we obtain a transabdominal ultrasound with a normal common bile duct and normal LFTs, we <coughs> reinforce the patient that, the, that it's going to get better. But what happens when we have a transabdominal ultrasound with a large stone in the common bile duct? The patient should go for an ERCP and treatment at the time. Um, transabdominal ultrasound with a large um, common bile duct stone and LFTs that are abnormal should go first for an endoscopic ultrasound and posteriorly go for an ERCP. The medical treatment is going to be our first line of option for this patient. So we tell them to adjust the diet, uh, medications to control the diarrhea or the gas pain or the bloating, antiacids for um, 
reflux or peptic ulcer disease. And for those patients who have chronic problems, uh, there's some literature that 12% uh, of these patients will require psychiatric evaluation. So the surgical treatment, uh, this is, uh, as I said, I'm not gonna talk about the, the acute problems, I'm gonna talk more about the chronic problems, the stricture, the retained stones, and the cystic duct remnant. So uh, the strictures uh, after cholecystectomy, the theology most of the time is related to the technique used, and the most common error is uh, energy injury to the bile duct and misplaced surgical clips. The incidence is pretty low, it's less than 1%. Um, these two studies, after uh, reviewing the patients, uh, they're, they're not very large series on these patients, but uh, the highest one that I saw was 38 patients. But these two, these two studies uh, really show that ERCP with dilation and stenting had a very good um, success rate of 80%, and um, Karuda in 2010 showed that 95% the, with the same ERCP stent and dilation. Um, what is the incidence of common bile duct stones after surgery? So uh, in a meta-analysis of almost 20,000 patients from Australia, they showed that the incidence is between 0 0.5 and 2.3%. And they talk about <coughs> if the, the stones were uh, uh, previously formed in the bile duct right after surgery or two years after they form. So depending on this, uh, after obtaining the right upper quadrant ultrasound, the modality or the gold standard uh, imaging studies that an abdominal CT follow with uh, ERCP that can be uh, diagnostic and therapeutic at the same time. Uh, these are just uh, ERCP demonstrating multiple stones in the common bile duct here. There is a large common bile duct stone. So what are the treatment options? As I said, ERCP in sphincterotomy and stone retrieval is very good. Um, and laparoscopic versus open common bile duct exploration if ERCP is not possible. Cystic duct remnant. Uh, this is a also very low incidence of uh, 0 0.02 to 4%. Uh, there is an increased chance of having this complication after emergent surgery. You have heard of those patients who come back uh, and the operative report shows a uh, partial cholecystectomy uh, secondary to severe inflammatory process or multiple problems. So the, the increase of uh, having this problem goes up in this scenario. The critical length is uh, if the patients have a uh, 1.5 centimeter or greater and the cystic duct is considered a cystic duct remnant. So what are the treatments for this? Laparoscopic versus open excision is uh, most uh, indicated. Um, most of the time the patients who present with a, a long cystic with no stones, they will be asymptomatic, 95% of these patients. Most of the time the patients who present to the, to the office and we can identify this uh, syndrome, the, 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 there is a presence of stone in the cystic duct. So the treatment is uh, mo uh, surgery. So uh, this is a diagnosis of exclusion. After extensive workup on all these patients, what happens when we cannot identify the, the, the reason or the problem? So we start talking about sphincter of body dysfunction. It is a more chronic presentation, uh, and this is uh, related to abnormalities in the relaxation of the sphincter at the duodenum. So the most common uh, <coughs> imaging studies that we can order are the transabdominal ultrasound that show the presence of um, mild to moderate uh, uh, common bile duct distension. And in 13% of the time, we can identify that little stone trapped at the sphincter of body. And the treatment for this is an ERCP and manometry. Oh, I'm sorry, the diagnosis is definitely manometry uh, that shows the presence of uh, 40 uh, millimeters of mercury in the pressure. So uh, what are the medical treatments for this uh, problem? Uh, medical treatment was uh, attempted in many studies uh, that showed my relief of problems. So in the first six weeks, the patient uh, showed significant improvement, but overall in the, in the following weeks, six weeks after, the patients developed uh, some uh, problems related to the medications, which they have to stop and they uh, regain their uh, symptoms. The Botox injection, I could not identify a randomized or any large study. There are um, only uh, case reports uh, with uh, some 50-50% uh, resolution of the problems. So uh, what is the surgical treatment for uh, sphincter of body dysfunction? For type one, which is related to patients with uh, right upper quadrant pain, 
dilated common bile duct <coughs> and uh, abnormal LFTs, definitely the treatment is going to be sphincterotomy. For the other two types, type 2 and type 3, that are related to the um, right upper quadrant vein but no abnormal uh, LFTs or uh, um, dilated common bile duct, there are mixed uh, uh, indications to do a sphincterotomy. So 50 or 60 percent will uh, resolve the problems. So in conclusions, chronic uh, post-cholecystectomy syndrome is a disabling disorder. Uh, as I said, 5 to 10 percent. The, inci the incidence is higher when we perform uh, emergent surgery. Treatment should be directed to a specific diagnosis and referral to uh, specific centers if necessary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions?